Ready? Hello <laughs> and welcome. You know, we appreciate you being here tonight. We're going to go through some questions to help you get tuned up for the exam. Tonight, we're going to be working on appraisal and a little bit on taxation. And uh, this is a really, really important part of the test. And, you know, I say that with some authority because I've taken a test more than any living human being. And it's not because I've ever flunked it. It's because <laughs> we had a number of years ago, our director of education for the divisions, somebody had asked him about, well, can I come in and take the test? I haven't taken it for years, you know? And he's, so he said, well, you know what? If you guys want to take the test, come on down and take the test. You can just take it in the office there at the division and we won't charge you anything. And, you know, so I went in there about 12 times and <laughs> took the test. 12 different times and I was taking the test one day and there was this word I didn't know what it meant I was just sitting in someone's cubicle pulled out the dictionary looking it up and the little gal comes by and says oh, roller you can't use the dictionary on the exam and I said I don't need to pass this test I'm just here to memorize the questions which I thought was funny but they didn't think it was funny so anyway I'm one of the guys they've asked not to take the test but that's okay they can't stop me from going to other states and taking it there but I'm kind of over that a little bit because, but I've been there a lot guys. And so that's part of it. But the other part of it is, is that Pearson view has this really cool thing called the candidate handbook. And uh, uh, Dan's going to bring up a little a video or a little link on that, show you what it looks like. But the candidate handbook is something every one of you needs to look at because in the candidate handbook, it tells you, yeah, here it is, Pearson View, Utah Real Estate Candidate Handbook, October 2020. It's, it's cutting edge, fresh. But in this handbook, it tells you for different categories of topics on the exam, how many questions are from that category. Well, this is extremely important. So, you know, you look at some of these categories here, like, you know, oh, Dan's bringing it up. Like, uh, well, it's a legal property characteristic, legal description, property use. And it shows right there, there's nine questions on the sales exam from these categories right there. So what you could do with this is, you know, don't spend half of your time working on a category that only has like five or six questions from it. Spend your time on some of these categories, like, you know, this one has 11 questions on property value and appraisal. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So that's how I know this is a really important part. That you should spend some valuable time in working with this, okay? So get, you know, go to the link. Dan's got it right there for students to use here at the school, the Institute of Real Estate Education, and uh, and take a look at that. So let's jump into the appraisal topics. So I really appreciate you being here. You know, and this has a lot of practical application as well, because, uh, you know, most people are buying properties, get a loan, and those people get a loan need to get an appraisal uh, for the most part, you know unless you're putting down like 50% or something, <laughs> which few people do. So sometimes they pay cash and don't even get a loan, but they don't do that much anyway. A little bit of our first question tonight. A vacant parcel is being converted to a shopping mall in two years. The owners of a small strip center located next to the new project have been approached about selling your property. What term describes a principle of value describing principle of value best describes the seller's deter determination to sell for more than what they would have before they became aware of the new project. Okay, so has a new project happened yet? No, it says it'd be in a couple of years, okay? So it's not there. So looking at the, you know, read the question again, okay? I know this one's kind of long, but read it again so you really understand what they're going for. Now look at the answers anticipation, highest and best use, substitution and conformity. Well, it's not there yet. So it couldn't be conforming or not conforming. It's, you really can't use substitution. It's just something that's coming. It's still not there yet. Highest and best use, eh, it might have something to do with it. But the real answer here would obviously be anticipation. Because this new regional mall is coming in, you anticipate that it's going to bring in a lot more people for shopping and whatnot there in that area. And, uh, you know, man, I made a lot of money uh, for one of my investors when I found out that the new regional mall was coming into uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. And th these are smart operators, you know, it was general growth properties. They did regional malls all over the country. And so what they did was is they, they optioned property on both sides of town. So you didn't know if the mall was gonna be on the east side or west side. 
Well, I knew what side I was going on because I had a good buddy that worked for General Growth. <laughs> That's nice to have insights and good buddies. So what happened was uh, we bought a 10 acre pig farm right in the area where the new mall was going in. We paid uh, $100,000 for it. It's about 10 grand an acre. And we ended up starting selling it once the mall was announced for a buck and a half a foot. And we sold the last pieces for about $3 a foot. So, you know, I mean, an acre has 43,560 square feet. So even at $2 a square foot, you know, that's almost $90,000 per acre. And we paid how much for it? 10. And how many acres did we have? 10. So you do the math on that. You know, I was, that was a good deal. You know, the, uh, my investor I put into that property showed up one day <laughs> after we'd sold all those and gave me a Mercedes Benz. That was a nice bonus. Number two, please. Conformity as a principle of states that a property's value is. Conformity as a principle of states that property value is. A, diminished by being too similar in form and function to other properties surrounding it. Mm. B, the highest when its form and use are in tune with the surrounding properties and uses. You know, it's like uh, having a subdivision in uh, all these beautiful, nice homes, and then in the middle of it is a, is a double wide uh, trailer home. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not conformity. Hang on to B, that one's warm and fuzzy. C, the match of property and buyer bringing the highest sales price. That doesn't even make sense. D, an architectural term referring to matching the properties with its surrounding. No, that's not true. The answer to this one, folks, obviously is B, highest and best use. Highest when its form and use are in tune with the surrounding property and uses. People like conformity. That's why you have a lot of planned subdivision, master plan subdivision. We're, we're not as good as that uh, here in Utah as they have been in uh, California. They have really, you know, they really enforce this. But here in Cal, here, you know, Cottonwood, a lot of areas you're driving through these multi-million dollar homes, you turn around the corner and there's a little crapper subdivision right next to it. You know, so people are buying all those, tearing them down and putting in new homes. Let's look at number three, please. As a component of real estate value, the principle of substitution suggests that. The real estate value. See, these are all principles, principles of value. And the principle of substitution suggests that, A, if two similar properties are for sale, a buyer will purchase the cheaper of the two. Hmm, that's a good one. B, if one of the two uh, adjacent homes is more valuable, the price of the other homes will tend to rise. Mm. If too many properties are built in a market, the prices will tend to go down. Uh, we don't have that problem right now. B, uh, but, uh, people will re readily move to another home. It's of, of equal value. Okay, now the principle of substitution, the answer to this guys, of course, ladies and gentlemen is A, if two similar properties are for sale, the buyer will purchase the cheaper of the two. In other words, a buyer will only pay the amount of money they have to to get the utility they need. And they substitute the utility or the use of or how they would use the property one for another. And if this one's 10 grand, $20,000 cheaper, they're, gonna, they're probably gonna buy that one if they have, you know, if everything else is equal. And that's why uh, you know, people do comparison shopping. They do it when they're buying shoes, clothing, cars, and they definitely do it when they're buying real estate as well. Number four, please. The concept of market value is best described as, okay, so we're looking for the definition of market value. And let's look at these. Okay, we've got um, A, uh, the price a buyer will pay for a property assuming other similar properties are within the same price range, okay. Well, that's part of it. Okay, the price of informed, unhurried and, uh, seller will charge for a property assuming a reasonable period. Okay, that has some of the properties in it, you know, like, like it's a reasonable time on the market and people are informed. Uh, C, the price of buyer and seller agree on for a property assuming stable interest rates, appreciation rates, uh, price of, eh, gobbledygook. And D, the price a willing, Okay, no one's forcing, informed, that's good, unpressured. You know, so there's no undue influence or pressure on the buyer or the seller agree upon for the property, assuming a cash price and the property's reasonable exposure to the market. Perfect. The answer is D. 
because it's the only one that has all the concepts of what market value is. It just makes reasonable sense, but you know you really need to know this. And definitions of words are very, very important on uh, uh, getting through the exam. And uh, that's why um, you, know, you ought to really spend some time learning all the definitions of the words. Number five, please. A broker's opinion of value is not the same thing as the appraisal for which of the following reasons? Okay, now a, a, uh, a broker's price opinion, BPO, is not the same thing as an appraisal. Why? Well, A, the broker is not a licensed appraiser. Hmm, that sounds warm and fuzzy. B, the broker is a market force himself or herself. Hmm, the broker's view of the market is contaminated by the influence of buyers. <laughs> okay. Hey, that's pretty creative. Okay. A D, the broker does not follow USPAP standards. USPAP is the uniform standards of, of the appraisal practices in, in the appraisal profession. And uh, they, all the appraisers have to follow that. Guys, the, the reason why we can't call what we do an appraisal, and it's not the same thing, is that we're not licensed, okay? We are not licensed, which is answer A, okay? And so you can't call what you're doing an appraisal. You know, oh, I'll come out and appraise your home. No, no, you can't, not unless you have an appraiser license. You could do a market study. You can do a broker price opinion. You can do a comparative park, a market analysis. You know, you could do a CMA, you know, is what we call it, but it, it's, you know, but you don't call it an appraisal. Okay, number six. A significant difference between an appraisal and a broker's opinion of value is, eh, okay, the appraisal, uh, the appraiser tends to use only one or two of the approaches to value. Okay. Uh, who do you think is regulated more tightly on value opinions? Us as a real estate professional or uh, you know, uh, a, an, an appraiser who's, who that is their only job on this deal? B, the broker may not be, <laughs> the broker may not be a disinterested party. Um, if, if you, you know, I mean, appraisers can't even go out and appraise their own house. I mean, you, if you have an interest in that property, it, you know, it's not going to work. The broker is subject to governmental regulation and generating opinion. Not, not really. Uh, we're exempt. We have a specific um, exemption in the law, in, in the Utah code that says that because we have a real estate license, we can offer value opinions, but we cannot call it an appraisal. Indeed, the appraiser uses less current market data. Now, obviously the appraiser uses current market data. And obviously, you know, we're not subject to government regulation and offering a, a price opinion. In fact, we're kind of, that's watered down for us. You know, so, you know, when you're looking at this one, guys, uh, we're going to narrow it down here. The broker may not be a disinterested party. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, well, that's pretty good. You know, what do you think? And the appraiser tends to use only one or two approaches of value. Obviously, that's not true either. Out of all these guys, the strongest and the correct answer is B, which the broker may not be a disinterested party, right? <laughs> which says that you are an interested party. Well, you're interested in the commission, of course, and the deal working, but um, it's kind of a negative contundrum there. But if you look at them over, you know, that's the best answer. And that's how these questions can be a little sneaky. Sometimes they sneak up behind you and whack you in the back of the head. Number seven, please. There's so many, uh, the, you know, you, there's so many great concepts in the appraisal part. And, and it's, it's a significant part of the exam. Okay, the subject property has a three-car garage. Comparable number one has a two-car garage. The adjustment should be. Now, what an appraiser does is they go, and when you get an appraisal, they'll go out and they'll find comparable sales. And they'll try to get those comparable sales to be as much like the subject property as, as they can. And uh, a great comp is something that's exactly like the subject property. Maybe the same neighborhood, maybe even built by the same builder, the same style, same, same everything. But that is rarely the case. Normally they have to make some adjustments. And the rule is you always, always, always adjust the comparables. You never adjust the subject. You don't adjust the subject because we don't know what it's worth. I mean, that's why we're doing the appraisal. 
we're trying to come up with an appraisal that gives us an idea of what the subject is worth. The comparables have all sold and closed. We know what they were worth. But sometimes you have a comparable here, which is very close to subject property. Only this comparable number one only has a two car garage and the subject has a three. So the subject is better than the comparable, right? So the appraiser says, well, at least on paper, I've got to add another garage to the comparable because uh, that would make it look more like the subject property, right? So A is a correct answer. At least on paper, he's going to say, well, to put an extra garage on that house would cost you know, $5,000. So they would add $5,000 of price. Now, where do they come up with these prices? Well, they can do an analysis of the market comparing where all other aspects of these two homes were exactly the same, but this one had a three and this one had a two and they were have both sold. And they say, well, this was sold for $5,000 more. That must be because of the third garage. But they also have another service they all subscribe to called Marshall and Swift. And Marshall and Swift Cost uh, Reference Guide has, the, they make studies of all the market areas and the appraisers uh, subscribe to this. And so they can put in their computer and it'll pop right up and say, okay, it's got a, the difference for this between a two and a three would be $5,000. And that's how they know. And you can subscribe to Marshall and Swift if you want to. I did for a while, but you know, it kind of, you know, it's just better to have an appraiser friend that you can call and ask them, what's the difference between a two car and a, th and a two car, a, th a three car garage? Take your appraiser or friends to lunch. They, no one ever does, but if you do, you'll have a good friend and you don't have to take them to the, you know, Market Street Grill, but you know, I mean, <laughs> take them to, you know, moderate price restaurants or anything. Okay, number eight, please. Um, you know, you feed them and the, and, the, and the puppy takes your calls. Number eight, the road in front of Jan's house has become so busy. She can hardly get out of her driveway without it being beeped at. She's afraid all her children play in a front yard. What kind of depreciation or, or loss in value is Jan experiencing? Is it physical depreciation? Now, physical depreciation is worn out carpet. You know, I mean, a uh, carpet with holes in it is not worth as much as brand new carpet. That's physical deterioration. Functional depreciation is, is, is poor floor plan. You know, it's like, you know, six bedrooms and one bathroom <laughs> I mean, it's kind of dumb you know or a hallway that leads nowhere or you know it's just it's just something that is not there economic is outside the property and since these streets are outside the property and you know maybe they've uh, traffic patterns have changed because of other developments and whatnot that have been put in an area what used to be a old country road is now a major thoroughfare out to a new development and whatnot. That's economic depreciation. Their property is worth a little less because of something that happened outside the property. Another example of economic depreciation might be a major employee. So the answer is C. But another reason, another reason you might see economic depreciation is where a major employer in a medium-sized town, you know, where just about one third of the population of that town is attached to this this plant or something and it shuts down or it's a mine or something it shuts down and uh, that's something outside the property as well but you know if, if half the town has to relocate because you know they don't have a job anymore that's a great example of, of economic depreciation the houses could still be the same home really beautiful well kept whatever but since there's no jobs and people are leaving uh, you know your prices will go down okay number nine an office building lacks sufficient cooling capacity to accommodate modern computer equipment. Okay, this is an example of physical curation, economic obsolescence, incurable depression, or uh, yeah, de depreciation or functional obsolescence. Okay. Once again, physical deterioration is peeling paint, poor carpet. Um, you know, something that's just you know it's just not kept up very well. You know, or um, economic obsolescence is something outside the property, and that, you know, that doesn't describe our situation here. You know, we have an office building, and, and you, you've got a potential tenant, but he says, you know, this, this, this doesn't have enough cooling for my equipment. You know, I mean, we, we do major computing here all the time. That's what we do, you know. Uh, 
incurable depreciation. Incurable means that it's something that can't be fixed. In other words, it costs more to fix it than you would get back if you fixed it. That way makes it incurable. If it's curable, you know, like the bad carpet, you rip out the old carpet, put it in, it costs you $2,000, but you got 2000 or more back, that would make it curable. Well, that's not what we're talking about here either. We're talking about functional obsolescence. We're talking about, I mentioned functional obsolescence as poor floor plan, but it could also be inadequate equipment in the property for uh, the tenants you're trying to rent it out to. And usually people, if they're going to put in a server center or something like that, they'll do their own remodeling and put in their own equipment. Um, but, you know, some of these firms like software companies and whatnot, that they have a lot of computing. And, you know, it's not like they're a server center or anything like that, but, but they do need really good AC equipment, you know, because it just gets too hot. So it's not going to work. You're going to have to upgrade your AC for the building or... Um, or go find a tenant that you know doesn't need it. Number ten. Now, one of the approaches to uh, value uh, that we're looking at, particularly in commercial properties, but also in res residential, there's a one line on the form, <laughs> one line, uh, because all appraisals have to have three approaches to value. You know, and one of them is the income approach. And the, the basis, the foundation of the income approach is net operating income. So you need to know the formula for net operating income. You just got to know it, guys. Okay, so is it gross income minus potential income minus expenses? Gross income minus potential income. That, that didn't make sense. B, effective gross income minus debt service. Debt service has nothing to do with uh, NOI, net operating income, nothing. That's, that's, that's a giveaway, okay? But, so that's wrong. Potential gross income, that sounds good, minus vacancy and credit loss. Vacancy and credit loss is not taken into consideration, you know, and then minus expenses. Let's, let's look at this last one, D, um, or maybe that's good. We'll see. Effective gross income minus vacancy and credit loss. Now, vacancy and credit loss is part of it, but it's not all of it. Okay, so the, the best answer for number 10 here, guys, is C. NOI is gross operating income, okay, minus expenses. So vacancy and credit loss and the expenses are all part of it, okay? So number 10 is C. All right. We're doing good. Now, if you're having, if you're struggling with some of these, this just means you need to spend some more time on the appraisal part of the test. Um, now, there's a lot of things we can do. If, if uh, you know, you can come to these classes, you can review these videos. And we strongly suggest that you do that. You can go ahead and retake a class if you wanted to. Uh, if you bought the manual, you could read the manual, which is fantastic. You know, it's got a great section, and this is something you really need to understand. Um, and you can call us, too. You know, my phone number is 801-556-8000. And, uh, you, you know, if you're having problems uh, understanding, so just, just reach out, you know. Well, we don't want to bother you. Well, <laughs> I'm lonely, okay. Give me a call. You know, I want to help you. You know, so just give me a call. If I'm busy, I won't answer the phone. It's just that easy. So call day or night. You know, I mean, don't call at one in the morning, but you know, you never know. Uh, just call, okay, and we'll help you. And Dan uh, can put up my phone number, and also, um, you know, you can call Dan. You can call the school, and you know, there's all kinds of places you can reach out to and get help. Okay. We want you to pass and we want you to pass the first time. I'd rather you take, uh, instead of paying for another test do over, I'd much, much rather you take your, you know, friends out for a sweetheart out for a celebratory dinner or something. Number 11, the principal shortcoming of gross rent multiplier approach to estimating value is that uh, numerous expenses are not taken into account. Okay. Uh, the multiplier does not relate to the market. That's totally fallacious. Uh, the method is too complex and cumbersome. Gross rent multiplier is so easy and so dumb that we doesn't really have that much credence. Okay, uh, 
it's just a number that appraisers kind of know that, you know, on their way out to look at a duplex or a fourplex or whatever, they know that in that area for a fourplex, the grocery multiplier is eight or nine or it's seven. You know, and uh, how do they know? Because they've appraised six or seven, 10 duplexes in the last year or so. And, and they get together and they go to lunch at McDonald's or something. And they, and they, they, um, they compare, they talk about this. This is one of the reasons why you need to make an appraiser your friend. So you can call them and say, look, I'm looking at a listing a, a, a duplex in, uh, in West Valley. You know, what's, what's a good gross rent multiplier for that? It's quick and dirty. And they say, well, you take the gross income, gross income. Okay. So numerous expenses are not taking me that that's, you know, but the, the correct answer in number 11, by the way, is a, okay. Because, um, it's gross rents. <laughs> and that's one of the fallacies of it. But, but anyway, it's just a quick and dirty thing. They know that you know, uh, if you take the gross rents and multiply it by nine, that's about where we should come in. You know? So if you're going out to, look to, to appraise an income property, uh, where are you going to get the gross rent multiplier? Well, you, <laughs> you're going to call your appraiser buddy and ask him, hey, what's a good gross rent multiplier for a fourplex in uh, West Valley? They'll say, oh man, you know, the last few I've done out there, they came, they came in at eight and a half. Invaluable, invaluable. You got to build a team, guys. You got to build a team. And they're not really on your team, but they're your real estate buddy. And they have a lot of information that they can be very helpful to you. Number 12, please. Which of the following types of gain are taxable? Now we're getting into the tax stuff, Okay. Income tax, and um, we have stepped away from um, a, a appraisal for a little bit, and we've added this income tax. So this next questions are all tax kind of questions, and uh, in, in income and property tax questions. And you know, th this is something that you really need to be aware of. And that is, there's some words that you run into uh, in real estate test. And, get, and getting your license that mean different things in different contexts. So when you look at the word depreciation and, and you're in the appraisal mode of things, um, that means something it's like physical wear and tear, uh, functional obsolescence is another type of, de of depreciation, but it, it is real things. But now we're in the tax world. And when you say depreciation in the tax world, it means a whole different thing. It is a tax loophole concept that uh, the government has in place uh, for income taxes that you can actually depreciate your property and uh, in offset other taxable income with your depreciation. In fact, if you own enough real estate, you can depreciate almost all of your income uh, depending on you know, the, the, the size of your income. Um, and, uh, you know, owning, owning real estate is fantastic because it, it can shelter some of your other ordinary income from uh, taxes. But which of the following types of gain are taxable? Realize gain on a property held for any number of years. Okay, now realize gain means that, you know, you bought it for 100 and you sold it for 300. That's a realized gain of a couple hundred grand. Has nothing to do with depreciation or whatever else. Uh, but it's realized gain, you know, and, and when you're figuring in how much your gain is on a property, um, you might have to recapture some of your depreciation. One, There's a whole formula for all this stuff and pretty much beyond your normal uh, sales exam test. But, but you have to know that when you use depreciation in a tax sense, it means something. It's, it's, it's fuzzy thinking IRS tax law that, that was put to benefit investors because the government knows that people need a place to live and many of them can't afford a, a house, but they still vote. <laughs> and so they want to encourage people to be an investor and, and create properties for people to live in because voters are happy when they have a nice place to live. Gain deferred for five years or more on a property held for for, you, for years. Mm, the first 10 years of appreciation on a property held for 30 years. And D, only the appreciation of property in the year prior to sale. All those are gobbledygook. The correct answer to this one, of course, is a realized gain on a property held for any number of years. And you have to look at your cost basis and other things. Um, you know, we're not trying to train you to pass a, uh, an accounting 
CPA type test, but you, you need to have a good handle on some of this. But you know, if you had that candidate handbook, you could look in there and see how many questions there are on tax. And it's some, but it's not as substantial as appraisal. Number 13, please. I suggest all of you look at that handbook in preparing for the test because that means you're not overstudying something. It really doesn't have that much value to you on the test. A taxable event could occur in a 1031 exchange unless, unless. Okay, the sale, A, the sale proceeds property are selling are only handled by an intermediary. Okay, this is kind of a delayed exchange. And uh, we have intermediaries where they'll take the money. If, if the seller sold their property and, and took the money and then found another property they wanted to buy, that's not a 1031 exchange. Um, the exchange means you have to trade the equity in this one for the, for the, and put that into another property, but it can't come to you directly. So number of intermediaries that will take that money because sometimes you can find a buyer for your current property, but you can't find another one to uh, buy uh, as quickly as you'd like. Okay. B, we close the sale on the old property within six months. It's not the old property that governs or, or puts you out of the 1031 exchange rule. It's the new property. And uh, the selection of B or C, the selection of the new replaced property is completed before the old property is sold. That happens quite a bit too. And some fact, sometimes the reason they're putting the old property up for sale is because they found a new one they want. So they put it under contract subject to them, you know, getting the old one sold and everyone participating in a 1031 exchange. Um, so that's fine. You know, uh, but D, there is no boot in the transaction. Boot is anything... Um, it book could be cash, it could be something personal property, but it, uh, you know, it, it's like, hey, I'll throw this in to boot, you know, and it, it is, is something if you trade real estate for real estate, that's fine, but cash is not real estate. And to the extent you receive boot, that's a portion that you'll be taxed on. But a lot of times, you know, there's going to be one person taxed in a transaction anyway. Okay, so number 13 is the sale proceeds on property are given to an intermediary. You know, one of the biggest ones is uh, uh, Zion's Bank. Okay, number 14. Property taxes are property taxes now are determined by a municipality through the process known as appraisal. No. S cheat, where the state cheats you out of it. No. Assessment that's it, or evaluation, it's C, assessment. And that's why they have a whole uh, assess, you know, the county assessor's office. You know, it's assessment, okay? It's kind of a lot like appraisal, but, you know, it, but it, there are some differences. And they have their own sets of rules as well, but there, it's very, very similar, but it's called, not appraisal, it's called assessment. Although many of them are licensed appraisers. But they also have their own training uh, in property tax assessment as well. Okay, number 15, what kind of tax is determined relative to the value of the property? Well, there's a Latin word here. It, it's not a special assessment. It, the Latin word is B, ad valorem. And, and if you stare at that long enough, it will mysteriously translate into according to value. If you just stare at it and go cross-eyed. It's not a transfer tax. We don't have a transfer tax in Utah and it's not comparative tax, <laughs> okay? It is ad valorem. And that means according to value. So what kind of tax the term relative to the prop value of a property is ad valorem. The higher your, or the more your property is worth or might sell for or has been assessed for, the higher the tax you're gonna pay. Now, what we're looking at now is we're going to see a little retracement in values uh, here in the valley, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, real estate doesn't always go up. You know, sometimes it goes down, and I'm looking for, a, with great anticipation and excitement for the market to come down a little bit, so I can go out and buy some more properties and get a better deal on them, and uh, we're, we're going to see a little retracement in prices, in my humble opinion. Some people think we're not, but I think we will. You know, being in this 44 years, I've seen a lot of people, oh, you know, that's not going to go down. Yeah, it did, you know, sometimes much more uh, severe. And it might not be as severe as it did back in 08 and whatnot, but still, you're going to have, you're, you know, this, you're not going to have multiple uh, bidding wars on properties and things like that, which, you know, will give you a better chance to go out and buy. I'm real excited about it. 
So we should see uh, properties come down. Now, what I'm driving at here is if we're in a market where the prices have retraced a little bit, there could be an opportunity for you to go out and help homeowners challenge their assessment rate. You can only do this once a year and you have to do it like, you know, midsummer when people are going on vacation. <laughs> so, but you can, you can represent a property owner and you can do value opinions, broker price opinions, and you can go in and, and, and go to a hearing and at the board of equalization and say, this property is over tax because the value that you put on it here in the assessor's office is too high. You're using all these old comps and the new comps show that this value is worth less. You pull the value of the house down and then they pay less tax. And it might stay there for a while and it might bump up again when the market goes up. But you know, I did, I did these uh, a number of years ago and I, you know, I did in one year, we did 500 of them. And um, you know, it gets people, you know, we didn't charge much for it. It wasn't a big deal to us. I just wanted to meet a lot of property owners, particularly in areas where I was working anyway. And I became the realtor because I helped them reduce their taxes. You know, large corporations like the utility departments and others uh, that own lots of property all over the, the, the place, all over the county, they have whole departments that, that do this. You know, they go in and challenge their taxes every time they, they get a chance to. Now, in the last few years, it hasn't been popular because prices have gone up, 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 and up. And it's hard to argue that, you know, the assessor was wrong. But if they go down a little bit, might be an opportunity for you. Number seven, no, 16. No. Oh, we, okay. Yeah. Property tax amounts for individual properties are determined by a broker price opinion, no appraisal, no assessment. It's property tax, guys. Which one is it? It's assessment, not a comparative market analysis. Okay. Comparative market analysis we do when we go out and try to buy a property. The same thing as broker price opinion. Uh, appraisal is what a licensed appraiser does. We, we don't do that. Number 17. When a municipality needs to replace sidewalks or whatever they need to replace on the street, they may collect from the residents of that street by an aftermarket tax, transfer tax, special assessment tax, tax penalty. It's a special assessment tax, isn't it, folks? Because you're only taxing that part of the city or the county or whatever that was actually improved. Not everyone in the county has to pay for new street lights on your streets, but you know, but but you're going to pay them if you have to there, okay? Because you got them put in. And what they're going to do is they're going to uh, come out with what they feel a, a value is for that property based on that. And then you're going to have to pay a little bit more. And then you can pay it all off at once or you can pay it over a series of years if, if you want to as well, okay? Now, a little uh, epigram to help finish our class off tonight. And that is when we're talking about your real estate career, Think not of yourself as the architect of your career, but as the sculptor. Expect to have to do a lot of hard hammering and chiseling, scraping and polishing. You know, real estate business is a crucible, guys. You're going to have to jump in and, and uh, take the heat and you're going to have the dross burn out of you. But that is really that is really true. You know, uh, this is a business that you can get in and you make help bless lots of lives and make lots of money, but you're also going to have to grow. You have to grow into it. And we are entering into a changing market. I'm excited. You know, uh, good realtors always make more money in down markets, <laughs> although good realtors have made a lot of money in up markets too. But it's, uh, you know, whether it's an up market or down market, folks, it's always a realtor's market. We just take our commission off the top, you know, uh, as it as it sales by you know on sale but thanks for being with us tonight uh, call if we can help and uh, hope to see you out there and we appreciate you being here uh, we're very dedicated to giving you the finest education you can get in real estate love to throw in a few practical things from time to time as well want to thank Dan for being here tonight. He's been our host, uh, even though he hasn't said a whole lot. And he has also been our technician as well, making sure everything runs smoothly. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you guys coming. We'll talk to you again soon.